Okay. Um, welcome to Writing, Publishing, Books with Free Software by uh, Mr. Nathan Haynes. Um, uh, Mr. Haynes is a um, local community council member of Ubuntu and uh, California's uh, leader in the Ubuntu community. Uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I was introduced, my name is Nathan Haynes, and I'm a lot of things, but first and foremost, I'm a computer enthusiast. I'm a programmer. I started when I was uh, 12. Actually, when I was 10, I got my first computer, and the only thing it did was turn on in about two seconds. Green screen, uh, extended Microsoft uh, extended color uh, disk basic for Microsoft copyright 1982. Um, computer was eight years old by then, but I didn't know any better, and uh, learned to program. Uh, DOS came out, got my first PC, programming was fantastic. And the other great thing that computers are great for are games, and I'm an avid gamer. Uh, unfortunately, I tend to buy games on Steam during their winter or uh, their seasonal sales, and then never play them again. And good old games has only uh, exacerbated the problem because they're like, so if you have 62 cents, you can get Biomenace. And I'm like, I downloaded that from the bulletin board in 1993. I should get this. And I actually did play for about an hour and a half. And um, hopefully I will play once more. But um, as life is on, I tend to taste games and no longer savor them. Um, but I still uh, have the heart of a gamer. Um, and of course, I'm a computer technician. I've been a freelance computer technician for something like 18 years now, uh, which is odd. Actually, if I think about it, no, I have a birthday in April, uh, and then it will be 20 years, and I'm going to stop thinking about that right now. So um, uh, I've had a lot of experience with computers, um, uh, you know, using them, enjoying, you know, having fun, building them, tweaking them. And when you're 12 years old and you break your computer, you get the family computer, you get really good at fixing it before your mom finds out. So uh, that, that led to my life choices there. I'm also an Ubuntu member, and um, that means several things. I'm, uh, I'm one of three leaders of the California local community, community team, and um, we're loco for a short. We're crazy about Ubuntu. And uh, we do things like um, we provide speakers in the California area for things like speaking engagements, install fests, uh, release parties, and um, scale qualifies as a speaking engagement, so we, uh, we worked alongside Canonical and the greater global Ubuntu community to bring speakers from all over the, over the world for Ubicon, uh, Ubicon Summit, actually, uh, on Thursday and Friday, and uh, I think trickling out a little bit here and there. Uh, and I can't claim uh, responsibility for having Mark Shuttleworth here, uh, but I was sort of involved in the process a little. I'm also a member of the Ubuntu Local Community Council, and uh, we help uh, sort of mediate issues uh, in the, for loco teams uh, all across the world since they, they tend to be by country. In the U.S. it's by state. Uh, so if there are any uh, questions or they need help or one new one starts up, we help make that process as smooth as possible. But um, the reason I'm here today is because I'm also an author. And so I've written lots of things in my life. I've written uh, a lot of tech writing for, uh, for work. I'd, write, uh, I'd find no documentation, and I would write some documentation. And I'm about to say, that's really great. You should do that from now on. Um, and that's where um, the, uh, the vaunted um, other duties as required in those job applications uh, comes in. Uh, I've also written introductory magazine articles for uh, tutorial articles for Linux. Um, Linux Identity Magazine. And uh, just this year, I actually uh, sat down and wrote an entire book, Beginning Ubuntu for Windows and Mac Users. It was published in September. And um, it's a good book if I do say so myself. It's sort of, um, you know, there's all these books, uh, Linux for Beginners and so on. Um, this book assumes that you're already a computer expert in Windows and Mac, but that um, when you come to Ubuntu, everything's different. And so that can be really frustrating. You're a computer expert, but everywhere you turn in Ubuntu, is, you're kind of stymied. So the answer, of course, is just to get a little bit of context and understand what's going on. And everything's really easy. It's like being in a foreign country, and they have stoplights, but you go to Germany, and the red light starts blinking, which is kind of weird, right? And that means get, uh, get ready to hit the gas because it's going to turn green. Also, stay out of the, uh, the zebra stripes, the crosswalks, when it happens. Or if you're in Germany, if you go to a bar or at a restaurant 
and it's full. You walk up to a table of people, and you say, is Tino Fry, which means, is this seat taken? And then you sit down among strangers, and you chat. And so, we're, right, it's just no big deal once you know that. But to start out, you know, there's no context. So um, this book kind of walks you through steps uh, through installation, gets you familiarized with the interface, and then sets, sets up a bunch of tasks. If you want to do this, you can start here. This is what it looks like. If you want to organize your photos, you use this. Listen to music, you do this. A uh, little bit of command line stuff, but not here's how you use command line. It says in the book, if you want to use the command, learn to use command line, go find a different book. But here's some fun things that are really useful on the command line. And then we do virtual machines and stuff. And um, it's uh, not only great if you are learning Ubuntu, but it's also great if you maybe have a friend, uh, if you love Ubuntu or another Linux distro. If you have a friend uh, who wants to get started but is intimidated, this is the best way to start. So Ubuntu, for those of you who don't know, is a, compute, uh, a complete solution for your computer. It keeps everything secure and up to date because if you use an LCS for the next five years, uh, you get security um, updates and, and bug fix updates. And it's built entirely, with the exception of one or two drivers and firmware, uh, entirely from free and open source software. So Ubuntu is what I'm going to use to uh, describe uh, some of the publishing process. And in fact, this book was written 100% completely in Ubuntu, aside from some Windows or Mac screenshots. So if you use a different Linux distro, then you already know that all distros are the same and equally as, as powerful in the, and, and capable in the right hands. But if you are here at scale for the very first time, or if you're watching online, and you want to get started, uh, Ubuntu is a fantastic place to start. So this talk is about writing and publishing a book using free software. And the first question that comes up, of course, is why publish a book? And there are many reasons. Some people have a story they want to tell, and some want to connect with others. I myself have a bunch of, uh, I'm a budding um, want to be a novelist, like most people. Um, all Americans have the next great American novel in them. Uh, I don't because I want to write sci-fi, but and not as opposed to um, to uh, you know mainstream uh, literature, li literary fiction. But it's a human sort of desire to want to connect with others and tell stories. As far as we know, we're the only creatures on Earth or in the known universe that actually do tell stories that uh, that can come whole cloth out of things that have never existed before. And so. A lot of people get stuck on that very question. Well, why should I write a book? And you know, is it do what I is what I have to say important enough? And I would say humans are are storytellers in their nature. So I would say if you're wrestling with this story, you have a you have a cool story you want to write down, but you're afraid to share it. Don't worry about that. Uh, it's a human need to tell stories. Uh, I wrote. I wrote my book here because I wanted to connect with others intellectually. I wanted to help share some knowledge. And I do talks at local, uh, local Linux user groups, but I can't be everywhere. So this is, of course, a great way to get that word out. And everyone, of course, dreams of uh, fame and fortune and being the next Stephen King or J.K. Rowling. And that probably won't happen. But there's good money to be had by publishing as well. And of course, um, you know, it, it's hard to be the most famous person. But you can definitely get, get your, the word out there. So publishing a book really has two sort of uh, sides to it. There's traditional publishing and self-publishing. Now traditional publishing uh, has sort of been around for the last 575 years. The printing press was invented somewhere around 1440. And so we have almost 600 years of, tra of tradition. That's why they call it traditional publishing. Uh, before that, of course, you, um, you, you wrote with a paintbrush dipped in ink in uh, on papyrus, pressed from reeds. Before that, you pushed reeds into uh, clay um, tablets. Uh, but the traditional publishing, the printing press changed everything. And so if you wanted to mass produce a book, you didn't have to hire a room of scribes in a scribatorium. And so the, many of those things in traditional publishing that don't really make much sense in the last decade or so are because uh, it's the way they've been doing things for a very, very, very long time. And as, things, as the publishing landscape changes, there's just some inertia. So I'm going to, be I'm going to describe that process in detail. Now self-publishing has sort of been a dirty word for a very long time. 
it really started in, well, in the old days, you could uh, get that, uh, that papyrus or that vellum, and you just start writing letters, and that wasn't really very efficient. And it was when the, um, the mimeograph machine, the zero, the zero, uh, the zero graphic copy machine, really sort of started, came into being where people could type or they could uh, write things and, and then make lots of copies. So we have uh, in the 50s and 60s, especially the 70s and 80s, fanzines uh, and you know, underground presses. And then you also, have, um, uh, you also have vanity presses, which are companies that purport to help you publish your book and really just charge you uh, for all, all the different types of steps that you would, a publisher would normally uh, pay the money for. And then you have to buy a bunch of copies of your book. And then you have to sell copies of your book outside your, at the trunk of your car. And none of the national chains buy books that way. So um, vanity publishing, vanity pressing, uh, presses really gave self-publishing a, a bad name. And it's only been in the last, really the last um, eight years or so, uh, and really caught on in the last five years, that, that online independent author publishing platforms like uh, Kindle Direct Publishing through Amazon, Nook Press through Barnes & Noble, uh, iTunes uh, Bookstore, Google Play Books, uh, Lulu Press, Cafe Press, uh, and so on, have really made um, self-publishing physical books really cheap, really easy, and, and, and something that has, especially in the last four years, become really legitimized. And so, so if you've heard of self-publishing and you think of vanity uh, publishers, uh, things have really changed. I'm going to talk about that a bit. So traditional publishing is pretty straightforward. It hasn't changed in a long time. The first step is to write the book. You want to publish a book, you write the book first. That seems a little silly, but the way it works is that you, you write the book, you uh, revise it a few times, share it with some friends, you get their comments, maybe, maybe take their feedback into, into consideration, uh, make sure you proofread it, and that's the only time that you're ready to actually contact a, a publisher. So uh, they only take finished, completed fiction books. Now there's an exception to that. Nonfiction books aren't sold, uh, the whole entire manuscript, they're actually sold by proposal. So for my book, for example, uh, a friend of mine named, dropped me to an editor who was looking for Ubuntu authors, and so I got an email and said, would you pitch a book? We were looking for this or that. And so I wrote a table of contents, so on. It described why I was an expert qualified to, to write a book about, about Ubuntu. And then they, they came back to the comments. I made some adjustments to the table of contents, the outline of the book. And they said, great, we like it. Go ahead and start writing the book. And, and we signed the contract, and then I started writing the book. Um, but traditionally, fiction, you have to actually have a finished book. So the way that works is that you, you typically submit a manuscript to literary agents, and they take a look, and they decide whether or not they think the, that they can sell your manuscript to a publisher, and then uh, they accept or decline the, uh, the manuscript. And if they accept it, if they, if, they, well, if they reject it, you keep submitting to other agents. If they accept it, then they'll take your book, and the agent will submit to publishers and see if they can get any bites. If you're really lucky, two or three or four publishers want the same book, and it goes to, the rights go to auction. If you're... Um, most of the time, it just takes a while, and, and, and one or two uh, hits will come. They'll send a contract. You can review it, and so on. Uh, the, the publisher, when they want to buy your book to publish, they'll, they'll offer a contract. You always have the copyright on your book. Uh, you always own the copyright on your book. But what you're doing is you're actually selling your publishing rights, that, which is a subset of copyright. So you own the book, but you're giving away the right to distribute the book. And so most publishers actually want what are called first print rights, either in a certain area or in the world. Um, and so what you want to do is have something that's never been published before. If you post it online on your blog, you have electronically published it and can no longer sell the first publication rights because you've already uh, published it online. So you want to be a little tricky. You can get away with a couple excerpts or maybe a first chapter, but, but basically you, if you're going to sell your book Traditionally, you want to keep it offline. Um, so you don't have to sell all your rights at once. So you can say, I'm only selling North American rights. I'm only selling print rights. I'm only selling electronic rights. Uh, I'm not selling 
film rights or radio adaptation, audio adapt adaptation rights or audiobook rights, or uh, if you didn't know that you could do all of those things, you should probably have an agent because the agents do that every day uh, all their lives. That's how they make money. But um, there are some people who are a little worried about agents and so on, and, and, and every publisher has a policy on whether or not they allow um, what's it called unsolicited manuscripts, which is where you just send directly to a, to a publisher. Most don't. Some do. And mostly they only allow agented submissions, which means the agent goes through. And so um, you know, there are various uh, pros and cons that I invite you to explore before you decide to uh, send your book out. So if your book's accepted, the publisher offers a contract. If you like the contract, you sign it, and the publisher takes it from there, the end. So, and, and you will eventually be published. There's some, there's some back and forth, some proofreading, but that's, they take care of most of everything. Um, Self-publishing is completely different. Self-publishing, you're the publisher, so you take care of all those next steps after you write the book and it's accepted. So way, the way that works is the first step is still to write a book. And then because you're the publisher, once it's finished and you've done some revision, you are going to hire a couple editors. And there are lots of different kinds. There's copy editors. There's developmental editors. So a developmental editor, uh, which is something I sort of do uh, on the side, is that you take a story, and, and they take the story and they read it. And they take a look at how the plot flows, and they see, do the are the characters consistent? Is the... Um, you know, the grumpy mentor in the beginning, is he just really happy and go lucky at the end? That's probably an error. Or they'll take a look and say, well, there's no, we're not really sure what the plot is, what the important uh, point of the book is until maybe four or five chapters in. You should, you should know what the story is three, three pages in. And they'll take a look and they'll help shape that. Copy editors or line editors tend to, this is some gray area, but they tend to basically go through, make sure all the punctuation is correct and grammar is correct and so on. Uh, sometimes you can have them look for like dialectual things, and um, and uh, I have uh, one self-publisher who is British, and she writes romance novels where the usually one protagonist is British and one is American, and the last couple they've all been American. And so my job is to make sure everyone is speaking the right form of English. This is one of my jobs because it's an, it, she she almost completely nails it, but the the mistakes are invisible to her. So. Every so often, um, the heroine of a story will um, have been stood by the counter, which we don't say. And my favorite recently was uh, the, protagonist, the male protagonist walked into the bar and saw his friends at the bar necking back beers. And I knew exactly what she meant right away, but the American protagonist can say, oh, look at those guys necking back beers like that. You can't say that. So that's why you hire an editor. Also, she hyphenates everything, everything. No one's hyphenated which is fine for British English, not so fine for American English. Uh, the point is we want it to be one way the entire book through, and she decides which way is right. Um, I just make sure when I'm editing that it's the same way each, each way. Uh, that's the most important thing you can ever do, because if somebody picks up your book and reads the first five pages and there's spelling mistakes or grammatical errors, it's just weird to read, they will put the book down and never buy anything you ever write again. Uh, cover designers are also important. When you're self-publishing, you come up with the cover. Now, I can make my own covers, and in fact, you'll see a little bit later on a cover I did uh, for a friend of a friend, short notice, for like just a, a, a book he wanted to give as Christmas presents he wasn't selling. And I think that's a perfect example of why you should hire a professional, and not me, or not do it yourself, but it's a decent cover, and you'll see what a cover entails. Uh, a layout designer takes, a, takes your manuscript, and uh, makes it look pretty on the page or in electronic form. And you can spend a lot of time learning the technologies to do that, or you can hire someone else to do it and get back to writing. So uh, if you're a do-it-yourself kind of uh, person, you can definitely get in there. But if you do want to write a lot and maybe make some money off of it, you might be wasting your time. Of course, if you learn it once, you may, you may invest the time in once and then not have to hire anyone. Um, but everyone has different skills. Um, and self-publishing, because self-publishing requires so many different various skills that have nothing to do with each other, some people can do it all. Some people are really good at a couple things or really like to do. I know one person who loves to do their own covers. I can't stand doing covers, so um, I don't, or I charge a, a lot for it. Um, 
Um, but there's no shame in that. So it's sometimes at some point you're probably going to hire to hire someone else to help you. The last step, of course, is to publish the book. Uh, and in traditional publishing, publishing courses, the publisher takes care of that. So I'm going to talk about what all that means. But I do want to uh, sort of um, talk about money because that's the thing that you know nobody ever talks about. But one of the reasons we like to publish books or to write books is to get some money. And there are plenty of people who, who write for free. But uh, if you want to write more seriously, uh, money helps, right? So money comes to you in the form of royalties. And again, the system is completely different between self-publishing and traditional publishing. So with traditional publishing, the way this works is that you, you get the contract to write the book, and you, start, you sign the contract, you start writing, and the publisher pays the author an advance on royalties. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. A royalty is when the book sells, um, the bookseller gets the money, the, the, the publisher gets the money from the bookseller, and then they pay the author a percentage of that. That's what's called a royalty. And it's paid for every book that's sold. So in traditional publishing, um, the publisher pays an advance on royalties. So when I wrote this book, I got money before the book was ever on sale, long before the book was ever on sale. And so that was one of the things that made it easier to write the book. And so the breakdown is a little different per publisher, but typically a publisher connect, or collects uh, – so a publisher sells the book to a bookstore, and the bookstore doesn't pay the list price on the book. The publisher instead uh, pays about, uh, about 45 to 60% off of the book, depending on, on the contracts you know, the, uh, for the vendors. Amazon asks for a lot of money, but um, or, or off, but they don't return the books if they're unused. So, so uh, you know it's different. And so the publisher only gets about 45 to 55 percent of the list price of the book, and they pay the author, uh, depending on the contract, 8 to 15 percent of net profit. And if you have an agent, the agent will take a little cut of that. He'll take um, anywhere from usually 10 percent. Now, if you're a new author, it's usually 15% is kind of industry standard, and maybe if you sell lots of books, it kind of goes down. Um, but the agent will get some money uh, when you get paid. And so, like I said, the publisher will pay you actually in advance. So, so the so the pub, so the bookseller gets the gross, the, sort of the gross profit, right? And so uh, when you think of the – so this isn't for the public. This is uh, – you walk into a bookstore, right? The gross profit goes to the bookseller who, who only gave the publisher maybe 60% of that, maybe 50%. So of the gross profit for, at the cash register, right? And then so from that, of that net profit to the publisher, that's where your royalty comes out of. So – uh, in fact, I'll give an example. So, for this, so this book was published through A-Press, and because this is a standard contract uh, that is on their website, I can tell you that uh, they, offered, um, they offered a, um, a thing. Let me double check and see if I'm getting ahead of myself. I think I'm not. I'm not. Okay, so, so basically they said, um, We'll give you, um, here's our contract. We, they renegotiated everything. They liked, it, they liked the outline. They said, here's the contract. I said, great. Read it over, slept on it, woke up. And I wrote them back. And um, you should always negotiate your contract, always. They're going to give you the worst one-sided contract ever, usually. right? And so your job is to, is to just push back a little. So I read the contract. I loved the contract. Almost everything about it was absolutely perfect. Um, there, I didn't like the end rights, the, the, the rights, end of, end of rights reversion because it wasn't clear what triggered the end of rights reversion. But when it happens, if it happens, it was very clear I got this back and that back, and I didn't own the cover, but I owned everything else. And it was actually pretty cool. So everything was covered. I said, this is pretty good. Although what happened was I took a look, and of course I was interested in the royalties, and they said, we'll pay you a $1,000 advance on royalties, and it specified uh, a lot of places will pay you uh, like 25% on signing a contract, and then you write a bit, and halfway through you get another 25, and you finish it, it's 25, and you publish it, it's 20. You know, it's, it's, it's tending to be a little less lately. But they said, 
every time you hit 33% of the book uh, submitted and approved for, for, for print, uh, we'll give you 33% of the $1,000 royalty. I thought that's pretty good. So I, I, um, I, th I like that, thought about it, emailed my editor, and I said, um, I love the contract. The one thing is, uh, I, well, I told them, I said, I thought they should pay me three times that. I thought it would be a good thing because they had a really aggressive writing schedule. And I said, well, I'm a freelancer, and I'll have to write instead of taking jobs. So I said, you should pay me three times, $3,000. And they wrote back very nicely and sweetly and told me it, they thought it didn't matter what I thought. And um, that didn't go anywhere. They said it was a, well, they were very nice. It was, a, it was a standard contract, and they couldn't change that and so on. Uh, but So I wrote back and said, I understand. I said, well, the, unfortunately, uh, five weeks isn't, isn't enough time to write this. I think it will be longer. So can we relax the publishing schedule? And they said, absolutely. And so uh, they said I had, I think, two and a half months. And... 14 months later, the book was on shelves. But, so I blew my schedule a little bit. Uh, but you can, don't feel free to, they didn't, I said I wanted three times more than they were willing to pay me. And uh, they didn't, you know, uh, didn't delete my email and send me the spam filter. Uh, they explained and we went back and negotiated. And it was actually pretty quick because I, I did like the contract. But you want to be careful about that because once you sign it, you're, you're locked in. And, and, and so for this $50 book uh, list price, uh, I get about, if you go through everything, uh, actually, my royalty starts at 10%, which is a lot higher than usual. It goes up pretty quick. Um, but for those first 400 copies of this book, a uh, $50 book, I get something like $2 or 250 or something like that. Um, uh, I got published September 27th. My first royalty statement should come any day now. Uh, so we'll see exactly. But it's about, about 225 or so. Um, but they did a ton of work for me as well. Self-publishing is completely different. For self-publishing... You are the publisher, and so because you're self-publishing and you're usually going, um, well, you get 100% of the net profit, basically. And so usually you're selling on a, a directly on a, um, an online digital uh, you know, bookseller like Amazon or Nook Press. And so you get 100% of the net profit uh, when, you are, when you are selling. But the way that works is that you have the list price and your, your storefront, Amazon or Nook Press or uh, Smashwords or so on, is going to take um, a fee for, for uh, everything they're doing, Ho web hosting, um, bandwidth, storage, um, payment processing, which is actually really expensive. So you will typically, tip, typically get about 70% on Amazon. Um, I think it's 65% on Nook Press or something like that. Um, uh, with certain prices on Amazon, you can get 35% uh, instead of 70 um, although note that 35% is still six times what you're going to get with a traditional publisher, and so and, and I think it's 21 times you know a few 70. So um, Amazon really wants eBooks to be between 2.99 and 9.99. So you get 70% of of the list price. If it's uh, 1.98, $10, you get 30, uh, 35%. So uh, you have to sort of price accordingly. Um, although note that if I write a novel or a short story, and I sell it for three dollars on Amazon for two ninety nine. Every single book that sells, I get two dollars and eight cents. So that's not too bad. So there is money made in, in publishing, and uh, and this is for eBooks. When you actually publish actual physical books, you can you can create PDFs and go to like CreateSpace or uh, Lulu Press or so on. And uh, so for a three hundred page technical book, sort of like this. Um, and if you price it $25, you're going to make $10.50 because it's, it's going to be about $11, um, $13 to, to print. And so anything up above that you get, um, you know, a, a novel for $7.99 or $8.99, you might make $1.50 or so for a physical book. Um, and so that's something that you can sort of, um, sort of um, you know, look at the pros and cons and weigh the benefits of. So just to recap, the royalties are completely different between traditional publishing and self-publishing. So for traditional publishing, you sell the rights to publish your book, and you get, you get like 10%. You get 5% of the list price, right? You have teams of experts working on your book, and you have access to bookstores and libraries and so on, and that can be really advantageous. And so for self-publishing, you find and hire your own team. You still need the same people or at least the same roles. You can fill them yourself, but a bad cover will sink your book on Amazon. There's too much competition. 
a good cover and a good blurb, uh, will will make your book stand right next to all the traditionally published books. So, uh, but you will find and hire hire your own team. Uh, on the other hand, you get to create uh, keep entire uh, the entire creative control rights and marketing for your book. So, um, you know, the publishers, the traditional publisher chooses your cover. If you're self-publishing, you choose your cover. So, if you don't like the traditional cover, um, they might change and make some minor changes, but but it's Maybe you get two changes, but like, like like one replacement. But if you don't like it, it's too bad. Their team's going to decide it. So you have to kind of decide what's important to you. But most importantly, so I, managed, I, I mentioned vanity presses. In traditional publishing, all money flows toward the author. And that's really important. You'll find agents out there, uh, none reputable, but you'll find agents out there who will. Uh, are taking submissions. They only charge a $25 reading submission fee, so when they read it, right, they'll get back to you and accept or reject it. Or uh, if they've accepted, you know, it's $50 to start sending it to publishers. Uh, there are publishers who will um, sell you a low-priced value package to, uh, to edit and lay out your book as you self-publish. Those are scams. Every single time you are asked in the traditional publishing world, you pay other people money to help publish your book, it's a scam. What happens, I wrote that book. I got $1,000 uh, for the book. I got $1,000 because it was in their subscription program. I don't get any more money. I don't have to pay back that 1000 So I got $2,000 to write this book. I got $333 uh, months before the book was published, a third of the way through the book. I still could have walked away and not owed any money back. They hired editors. They hired cover layout designers and everything. Um, and Hopefully they make their money back. I, have, I, I think the book's doing well, but I won't, I won't find out until I get my first royalty statements. But it's not my problem if the book isn't doing well if they didn't make their money back. I suspect they have. Um, no one asked me for any money ever. Nobody gets paid until the back end when the book starts selling. Right? I don't get paid until I earn out that. I got a thousand dollar advance royalty, so my book, my share of the book, has to earn out a thousand dollars before I see a check. But I got it in advance. I got paid. Now, when you're self-publishing, uh, it's a little different because you're the publisher. So obviously, you're the publisher, so you pay for your cover. You pay for editors. But you only do that in the context of you're the one publishing the book. And then when you start selling books, you keep all the money. So there's a little investment up front. But um, you should not pay. You know, uh, I'll, I'll name um, you know, uh, Author Marketing Solutions, for example, is a scam company. They just want to sell you book packages. And then once the book's ready, it's, you're on your own to sell. Don't, don't do that. Um, you can get very reasonably priced um, uh, services. And you can actually join a, a billion, any one of a billion uh, indie author uh, communities online, and, and, and those communities will help you sort what's, what's working and what isn't. So the first step in publishing is when it's time to write. And so that's what this talk is really about. So when it's time to write, there are some tricks to remember, some really basic steps to, to remember. They're not even, I wouldn't go so far as even say tricks. The first thing is that you, you pick a word processor, and it can be LibreOffice Writer, it can be Focus Writer, it's a really good minimalistic uh, writer that's actually in the Ubuntu repositories, or your favorite text editor, uh, which obviously is either Gedit or Nano, um, and definitely not Emac or by a VI. But, um, but it doesn't matter what you use to write. All you need to do is get down words on paper. I like, I, actually I wrote the entire book in LibreOffice Writer. I do kind of like Focus Writer. Um, but when it's time to write, what you want to focus on is actually just writing. When Max came out in 1984, office productivity dropped everywhere because people started spending all their time in, in Mac Write changing fonts and font sizes, and this one's outlined, and this one's there's Helvetica, and here's uh, Times, and here's, right? and here's some margins. And you could, so, so when you used Word Perfect, you, it was a DOS text-based thing. You couldn't see any of that. But when you're uh, in a graphical interface, you can, and you want to sit there and make it look really pretty. And that will keep you from ever writing a book. Uh, so if you choose a word processor, we're now, we're, nowadays word processors do everything. They do desktop publishing and so on. Uh, a word processor back in the day was, a, was just a fancy electronic typewriter. The idea was to get words into an electronic system, maybe edit them a little bit, and then print them out. So if you use LibreOffice, go ahead and, and you know, pick a header font, 
choose a, a initial first line indent, right? Maybe your body font, and then don't touch anything else. Use the header style, use the default text style, and just write. Because styles are good, but content's most important. And in fact, even writing this book, I got a bunch of templates, and they said, we want you to only use styles, don't use direct formatting. But if you have trouble with the, for, with the templates, the styles, don't worry about it. Just, just write, just type the text in, and we have people who are double checking everything anyway. So, so just make sure you write. And it's more, most important, the most important thing of your book is actually the content of the book, not the way it looks uh, per se. So um, you can even use a text editor with no markup at all, because uh, if you traditionally publish, they, they want it uh, double, uh, you know, double line spaced in uh, Courier 12 point or, or Times New Roman anyhow. Um, so you'll have to throw away all that formatting anyway. If you're self-publishing, unless you're doing it yourself, the editor will probably throw away a lot of that markup and reapply it themselves. So, so you're just wasting time. You're procrastinating. And um, you don't need help procrastinating when you're writing a book. There's plenty of opportunity. So I wrote my book about free software, about Ubuntu, entirely using free software and Ubuntu. Aside from a couple of Windows and Mac screenshots for demonstration purposes, everything else was entirely in Ubuntu. Even the Windows screenshots were in Ubuntu and virtual, a virtual box. So when I, when I got uh, the acceptance uh, letter and uh, the first initial templates, my, agent, my uh, publisher said, um, uh, welcome aboard, and we want you to write uh, using uh, Word, and we have these special templates for you. And so here's the templates, here's the fonts, and so this is how my publisher expected me to write. And, but it turns out I told them, well, I intend to write this book in LibreOffice uh, until or if it actually causes any kind of problem. I'll, I'll switch to Word if that's what it takes, but I'm going to write it all in LibreOffice. And so my publisher expected me to write the book this way, but how I actually wrote the book was this way. And it looks very, very, very similar. Now, the fonts in the template aren't perfect, but even when I was, when I was using the, pu the publisher-provided fonts, the names didn't quite match up in Office on Windows either, because I did uh, grab the trial of Office 2016 and install the fonts just to make sure it looked something similar before I you know, got to work. Uh, they had a great template document uh, showing all the styles. So I just uploaded that. I just uh, opened that, took a look, said, okay, I can do that. Um, so the book goes through post-processing through print. So the fact that some of these fonts might not be perfect, uh, some, of the, um, some of the layout might be, not be perfect. Um, there's that weird font thing in the middle. Or maybe, it's, maybe it's a projector, uh, sharp shot. It didn't matter. And so um, the, 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 the first page of each chapter had like a swoopy line decoration thing, chapter one, swoopy line, and then everything. Uh, that, didn't, that hardly ever worked uh, right on my system, but it didn't matter because um, well, the book went through post processing. They stripped everything out of Word, some XML type of uh, processor, and then it, it went to, uh, to press. So it wasn't a problem. And so what I would uh, really recommend if you're writing your first book is start with LibreOffice Writer. And the nice thing about LibreOffice is it lets you work with others even if they're using Word. So even though my publisher was actually using um, Word probably 2010 or 2013 or something, I don't know or care, I was using LibreOffice. And LibreOffice allowed me to work with others. LibreOffice has the Track Changes feature. And it's actually compatible with Word tracking comments. So when I actually wrote my, my book, I'd write everything in LibreOffice save it in uh, open document text format as I was writing. And then my last step before I sent, sent it to the publisher was just save, uh, open up, file, save as, save as docx, and then send it over by email. And then when I got it back, it was docx. And since it was just minor revisions, we, we kept that format. I had all their comments and so on. And um, so it's completely compatible with, with Word. And it's gotten better and better. So LibreOffice 5 is fantastic. Uh, and of course, your editors or beta readers can install LibreOffice for free. So if you're self-publishing, right, and you have someone that said, can you read my book, and it's an ODT format, and they said, I don't have LibreOffice or I don't have Word, you can say, here's a copy of LibreOffice. And so that's, that's one of the nice things about free software is you can provide that software to others. And then they can install it and have an enter LibreOffice is really an enterprise-grade word processing office suite, right? Uh, word processing spreadsheets, presentation software. This is LibreOffice, of course. 
uh, and they'll, re they'll thank you forever. Um, of course, the downside to that is that uh, you will be responsible for anything at all that happens to the computer or anything electronic in their home. Um, so two years from now when their Microsoft fails, uh, it's your fault, um, and they need you to help fix it because it happened after they installed that LibreOffice that you've recommended them. Um, so that could be a downside. Um, but, and then, of course, any, um, any season editor may already have Word, and you probably don't want to try and make them use a tool they're not comfortable with, like LibreOffice, but you can take those Word documents right back and it's no problem. Um, so I recommend using LibreOffice to track revisions, but some of you out there are going to say, well, what about source control? A bizarre Git or a Subversion? I'd say that's probably overkill. Um, I like the idea of it. Um, I very briefly considered it before deciding that was crazy. Um, but the problem is it's really good for tracking changes, but not good for tracking comments. And so if you just want a really complicated way to get a diff of one revision to the other, version control will do that. But the most powerful thing uh, when you have an editor is that they can leave comments on text, and so uh, you lose that with, uh, with uh, source control. Unless they are going through the document, and every time they make a change, uh, they make a change, save it, and then check it in and with a comment, a commit message. But that's good luck finding someone who will do that, I think. So uh, this is what revising looks like in LibreOffice. And as you can see, this is uh, one of the first uh, chapters back, in, uh, back from uh, the editor. And there are some comments there. So he, uh, those are all done in Word, and uh, they display perfectly. So what we have here is that if I can see here, I, the slide's too small. So this is solitaire, and I want to show in this chapter uh, that the, you can run Windows programs using Wine and so on. So I have here um, I'll write solitaire, and I have here Windows solitaire running on Wine, and I thought that was really funny. Uh, and so my, uh, my lead editor actually here said, please add a reference to this figure, uh, 2.11, 2-11, before it shows up the text up above, because I, I wasn't doing that in my first two chapters, and I got them all back and got to change every single one. Um, my tech uh, reviewer here, um, he thought that because when you install Wine, there's a Notepad program that is not actually Notepad, but looks just like it, that people might also expect to see uh, Windows Solitaire when really I grabbed this from a, I think an old Windows XP installer or something, and, and um, and ran side by side. So he said, please clarify that this does not come with Solitaire, and you have to go find your own Windows programs, but they run here. And so that's the kind of thing that I, I thought I was making a quick joke, and then people said, this could be confusing. Fix it, and told me how to fix it. And um, when somebody just, so Jess was 100% completely right. He's um, actually helping on the, on the AV team, so he might be listening right now. Thanks, Jess, you were great. Um, he was completely right. Typically, when somebody you get feedback from beta readers, um, editors tend to be a little more on the ball, but you get feedback from beta readers. If they say something's wrong, they're right that it's wrong. They're wrong on why it's wrong. So um, you don't have to follow everyone's feedback perfectly. In general, I found that all of my feedback was pretty much exactly on the ball. Um, the interior layout actually is the next step in the process. You want to have your manuscript basically locked down and completely written because if you have pagination and um, so on and all, all sorts of things all set up, and then you go and add an extra paragraph, it can bump everything off, and then you have to redo, you know, if it's like chapter one, for example, you have to redo the whole book. So you want to make sure your manuscript's finished. Um, and so it's, it's the next step in the process after you've actually written the book and it's been edited and it's ready to go. LibreOffice uh, can be used, and for simple things I've actually done this, uh, you want to use a sort of a styles, uh, the styles feature and the pages, the page format option, and you don't want to do a direct publishing, uh, direct uh, formatting rather, because if you change the font, if you select everything and change the font, right, and then you copy paste something and add a different style, the font's not the same. You just want to tell all headers have this font or this big. All default text is this font and this big, and so on. Uh, in fact, because you remember what I said, you should not be doing this when you're writing your book, right? playing with fonts and so on. You can write the whole book, and if you used header and default text styles, um, you go to the format option, you go to style properties, and then you can put in fonts, and it just changes all throughout the document. You can see how it works. It changes everywhere, and uh, you don't miss any headers or chapter titles because you select it all and you're changing it. 
Uh, Scribus is actually the best way to uh, do uh, so just real serious desktop publishing. And unfortunately, I don't have tons and tons of experience with that. But uh, it really is a kind of a nice way to, um, uh, it's much like Adobe InDesign or, or so on, um, where you can actually specify text boundaries and, and wrapping around images. And uh, if you were really serious about it, um, that would be a way to go. And you get really fancy. If you're doing something simpler, LibreOffice might work. And if you're doing electronic books, you actually use a program called uh, Sigil is what I recommend. There are actually a lot of them, but Sigil is a an EPUB EPUB formatting um, editor for eBooks. And so um, an eBook is actually just mostly CSS and XHTML, so it's really simple. Um, but um, and for that reason, you don't want to do that in in LibreOffice or in Word or in Scribus. So this is what the first page of the book will look like, and this is a project. The text is. Greek, but it's, a, it's that project I mentioned that uh, for a friend of a friend, uh, I formatted a book. Uh, it was actually a memoir one of his clients had. Uh, his, uh, her father had created a, a, a food company back in the 1800s, and uh, you would recognize it on the shelves today. And he, in the 40s, he typed up on the typewriter his autobiography. So uh, he borrowed it and um, secret to her, had it typed up, sent it to me. I laid everything out. So the chapter is way at the top. There's no headers or footers, as there never is on a, on, a, on a first page. The facing page is blank. Chapters at the top in a special font with, uh, with uh, small caps. There's what's called a drop folio, where the actual text begins lower. And those are all details that you may not have um, recognized. You may have not have known that every book starts that way, but, but if you had a book where it's just page to page and the headers are there and the page numbers, um, you'd immediately say, this looks kind of weird because it's not like every other book you've read. So these are the details that a good layout editor, a layout um, um, artist can create. Interior page layout is, looks, looks like this. And of course, it is, you set the top, you have the title, and the author, and the page number at the top. And they can go different places, but there are details. And so that, again, doesn't go on the first page. Any title page, front matter, it's all different. And then the interior is laid out completely differently. Um, and an ebook, for example, will look like this. So whereas a print book will you'll lay out so it looks basically like what you'll see uh, on the printed page. And in fact, actually, uh, this is a PDF that did go to CreateSpace and was printed and came out just fine. Uh, this is an example of Sigil. Now, this isn't my book. This is actually the beginning of Pay Me Bug by Christopher B. Wright. And it's here because it's one, I love the book. And uh, I have it on a Kindle. I'm reading through it right now, but also because it's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 license. Uh, and therefore, I didn't have to ask anyone's permission. Although, when I was writing my book, I needed to show off um, a Calibre, uh, which is an e-book uh, management software. And I asked him, and he was happy if I could use a screenshot of the first page. And he said yes. So uh, thanks, Chris Wright. Um, so, if you've ever used an HTML editor, this looks really familiar. Um, complex formatting doesn't work in ebook devices, so it's really simple. Simpler is better when it comes to ebooks because I have an e-ink Kindle, and I almost never use a tablet unless I'm then uh, I, someone paid me to make their book look good, and I make sure it looks good everywhere. My tablet, my phone, my e-ink Kindle, and so on. Uh, for pleasure, I only read on e-ink devices. Um, so you really want to make things really kind of simple. Um, you see all the chapters are actually broken down into separate HTML files. And so um, Sigil helps you sort of work through that. And um, because it is a different process, take going from LibreOffice to, um, say, another program like Sigil. I know I think he doesn't use Sigil. Uh, I think he uses something else. But um, this is what comes out. So Sigil can help you make that change. But you also might be um, better served hiring someone to do it for you. Shouldn't shouldn't be too expensive. Last of all, you do cover design. And cover design is different between print and ebooks because print books need full wraparound covers. Whereas uh, ebooks don't, the only thing an ebook needs is actually a, um, just a front cover. And so um, you can use GIMP or Inkscape. Those are great graphical tools that you're going to use. And so um, for print books, for so an e-book, um, if you're writing, it can be inspirational to, to read, to have the cover in front of you, the cover art, it's like a short story. Um, but if you're writing an actual print book, um, you should wait until everything's completely laid out. This is the last step in, in the process because um, the 
spine needs to be so big, and depending on how many pages are there, and that's how big the picture has to be. So um, you want to make that the last step in the process. So this is a template for create space, whatever it should look like. Anything in the red is called the bleed area. It's so close to the edges that when they have the automated machines, it goes through the press. Um, they cut everything automatically, and it might shift a little bit here and there. They can't guarantee anything in there is actually going to be visible. So you want to have a little bit of extra blank space around there so that it's not white edges where it misaligns, right? Or so your title isn't cut off at the top. Um, and so this comes last. And when we look at an uh, example, so this is a, another Greek example of the book I laid out for, uh, for a friend of a friend. And I, this isn't the actual title and the, not the actual copy. In fact, um, we didn't have a trademark or copyright clearance to worry about there, so uh, I used images he gave me for this. I actually had to purchase uh, two stock images, so this cost me way more than the, the actual cover I gave him did. But this is what it looks like. You see the, the covers, the back cover on the left, the spine in the middle, and the actual cover on the right, uh, author bio, pull quotes, and so on. So that's how, um, that's how this sort of looks, the barcode and so on. And, um, so I like to think of this as the perfect example for why you should probably hire a professional. Um, but the client was very, very happy, and that made me happy. So the actual, as far as publishing a print book goes, traditional publishing um, means the publisher takes care of the step. But if you're self-publishing, then you want to use print-on-demand. Now, print-on-demand typically uh, prints PDF files, and so uh, there are a lot of different places out there, CreateSpace, Ingram Spark. Lulu Press, and so on. Um, this book, Getting Started with Ubuntu 1004, was actually printed at Lulu Press. And um, uh, I'll have this around. You can look at it you know, after the talk. It's actually really well done. You, you would almost never know. Uh, this book was actually traditionally published, and they still used print on demand. And it's a great book, and you, again, would never, ever know. Um, and that way, they didn't have to print 10,000 books and then pay for a warehousing, for example. Um, but basically, you create a PDF that looks just like the ones I did, exactly how it will look on the page. And then uh, you pay basically just a set cost. And then we, if you sell it, um, you can pad the, the list price so that you get the difference. It's pretty easy. Publishing an ebook um, is a little different. Most ebook uh, stores actually s support either Word documents or EPUB documents, which is a standard. And there are a lot of different companies, and you're going to want to sort of look around. Um, there's Amazon. Uh, Amazon has Kindle Direct Publishing, there's Nook Press, Smashwords, iTunes, Direct to Digital, Google Play Books, there's all sorts of places. Um, KDP or Kindle Direct Publishing is probably where you want to go unless you hate Amazon for some reason. But if you hate the largest book st online bookstore in the world, but you're trying to sell your book, you have to have temper your expectations. Um, but they, um, they have a really good royalty rate, and if you um, technically it's not a royalty because the, they're just the storefront, they're not really the publisher, um, which applies to every, everyone here. Uh, if you go exclusive with them, there's a couple extra terms and promotional offers that are kind of neat. Um, and it's a 90 day window uh, where if you hate it, then you can just let that lapse and you, you can go off. Um, so it's as easy as uploading a file, and then you're done. So as you can see, you can basically write and publish a book using pretty much only free software and on, on your end. And it's a pretty simple process. LibreOffice, Inkscape, GIMP, and you're pretty much done. Sigil if you're doing ebooks. And so I want to leave you with one last note as regards digital rights management. So I like to think of it really as digital restriction, restrictions management. And traditional publishers uh, usually give books um, well, when you're traditionally published, they have this final say on e-books uh, as far as DRM. DRM, of course, means when you buy the book, you're locked to certain devices. Um, you can't read it on, on any others. I'd recommend that DRM is not really helpful for self-published books or traditional publishing books, but, but published books, but that's not your call then. If you're self-publishing, um, DRM only affects paying customers. If someone strips the DRM and then distributes, distributes it, none of those people got the DRM, so it doesn't affect them. Um, and it can actually, there's a, a plugin for Calibre where you type in your Kindle serial number or something, and then every single book, every time you plug in your Kindle and it syncs all the new books to your computer, it automatically strips the DRM in like 
the time it took to transfer over the USB cable. So um, DRM is optional on all these uh, self-publishing bookstores, and I recommend that you just forego it. Um, sometimes people download a book and like it, and they go buy it. Or sometimes they say, this is really good. I'll go buy the rest of the books in the series or other books by the same author. And in fact, I read the first two chapters of Pay Me Bug uh, online, loved it, so I was Creative Commons, I said, that's really generous of him, and I'm going to pay him by going straight to Amazon and paying, I think it was $4 a time for the book, and I've never regretted it. So um, that's pretty much my time, and that's the talk. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them if we have time. So um, last question. With you first. The question was, um, so did I have an agent before I went to the publishers, or, or did I already get one? So um, I got name dropped, and so I got a direct solicitation, and then could just submit my proposal. Um, I don't know how big publish, uh, agents are in necessarily nonfiction, um, but agents only represent completed manuscripts. So you'll have the book first, and then you'll submit the book to the agent, and then the agent on your behalf will start looking. So you'll find the agent once your book's finished. And uh, if you submit to a, a publisher, and, and because they allow it without the agent, and they accept it, you're best served either finding an a IP lawyer to negotiate your contract or an agent then to represent you. And if you say, so I have this book that um, this giant publisher has been you know, willing to, uh, to, wants to publish, then um, agents will be much more likely to take them on because they only get paid when you sell and it's a done deal by that point. Uh, to find a, a reputable agent, you can look online. There are, uh, there are lists. Uh, duotrope, I think, uh, lists literary agents. Where you find your favorite books that are in the style of, your, of the book you're writing, and you find out what their editor is. It's usually on the copyright page, uh, so that you're not submitting uh, crime thrillers to a romance uh, agent, for example, right? So um, that, that's the best way to do it. Questions? The 6x9 format that you had is obviously bigger than paperback and smaller than hardback. Hmm. That's a standard? Is that, is that a specific name for that size? Uh, it is an industry standard. I think it's called B5 size. I'm not quite sure. Um, so the one you're looking at is a, you're thinking of as mass, uh, as a uh, mass market paperback. Um, and you can't find anyone online that will print on demand that size. It's like 5.58 inches by something. I don't know why. So 6x9 is kind of similar. You can do, I think, 5x7. It sort of just depends. But uh, when you go to create space, for example, uh, there will be a giant list of formats. And they'll do square formats and bigger formats. But if you want extended uh, distribution in bookstores, libraries, you yeah. have to pick an industry size. And they'll list them all. We offer this industry size, uh, st industry standard, non-industry standard, all right there. So. OK. And which one? Uh, is, did you pick the 6x9? I can't tell from here on your side. I think I picked. I think I did. That's a good question. Um, yeah, six by nine, uh, okay. because that's the kind of size you wanted. Uh, it, looks, it was a gift. It looks a little more uh, regal. But um, uh, yeah, I'd probably go five by eight or, or something uh, on a fiction book. So, yes, so you and then back there. So question one, where did you find your answer? And two, a friend of mine published a book, I think, with Lulu. I think it was. She's, she was self-publishing, and they, for the cover, they wanted some PDF, they wanted PDF files, but there's some sort of exotic flavor of PDF. I, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, I've never published myself through Lulu. So the first question was, um, where did I get the template? So a create space, um, you, you, you sign for accounts, your Amazon account, you say, I want to create a, a, a book, you pick the size, and then there are templates for you. There's war templates for the interior, which I ignore. Uh, so I'm better at that. And the cover templates I uh, follow religiously. Um, this actually came from, it says on there, actually you think it was from, there's another little company that does it, uh, but I don't see it. Oh, booknow.com. They give free, free things because they want to sell you something. But uh, they're hope, they're, this was free, and they're hoping you'll do some of their services. Um, and I just did it because I wanted the barcode on the book already instead of leaving that to create space, but they'll do that normally. Um, and as far as Lulu, so the cover create space wanted a PDF, so I did everything in, in Inkscape, uh, and then just said save as PDF. And uh, I didn't need anything special. So 
I would check Lulu again because things are changing so rapidly they might be a little more. Are there are options in there that you can check that makes the publishing and printing a lot easier is probably what they're talking about. Yeah, certain, about. certain extensions for publishers. It's probably true. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to ignore all that just through CreateSpace. But um, if you, I don't know about Ink, Inkscape anymore directly, but like uh, when you export to PDF in LibreOffice, you can say options, and there's a ton of different things that, that can definitely be. Used. And then just a second follow-up question. Um, when you're doing your research, did you try and figure out if there's anything like that will take a LibreOffice and convert it to say Sigil, or is it all man both are separate processes? You can't, so um, I like to basically strip all from. So basically, what I do is uh, my process um, that people pay money for is I take their document, Word document, grab a chapter, um, copy it, paste it into uh, GEdit, and then paste it into Sigil, and then I do apply any uh, other markup. Myself, I, and I can't craft the, the CSS file, um, and that's the easiest way because I don't, I don't want any other changes. A lot of authors actually take Word or LibreOffice and they save as the HTML, and then um, they can use bookmarks and so on. Um, and they have really good results with that. Um, I just I'm a little, I, I grew up in when I so the web was started in 1992, right? We first started seeing it at home, and uh, so 94, 95, I had a Text editor, uh, HTML editor. One side was the HTML code, the other side was like a preview, um, and that's how I learned to, to, to edit web pages. So, um, as you can tell from my website, so um, uh, that's how I like to do it. So. Um, I was, um, in terms of writing the book, do you say it's? 20 chapters, you create one document and you're writing in that one document, or would it be more advisable to say break it into 20 different files as chapters and then reassemble it? And then the other um, thing that I'd like for you to talk about in self publishing, kind of the cost in terms of the quantity, you know, versus quantity, you know, number of pages in terms of your experiences as a self because you have to pay for that up front. So, um, with uh, so in regards to um, about that. so in regards to, to to whether you break, you have one giant document for manuscript or you break it up. Uh, it really depends on the length of the document. Most of my clients uh, will sort of take a um, a, uh, I'll get like a 60,000 word novel and it will be one giant document. That's fine. I, I have to seek around to copy paste the chapters. No sweat. Um, for the traditional published book, they actually wanted everything in a single uh, chapter by chapter each document. And that made it easier because I would finish a chapter and I would submit it. And that was done. Whereas if I had, um, and then they'd work through some work on it. If I actually had a, um, if I were self publishing and writing a novel, I would probably just do it in one document because I'm really lazy and don't like to handle that many documents. Um, but it really is a matter of preference. The one thing is if you're writing something really, if you're writing something long, if it's just text, you'll be okay. If you're writing something complex with lots of uh, figures and pictures and so on, it really is best to have separate documents because if the document gets too big, uh, it can cause problems uh, and make the word processor unreliable. So I would, I would, I would say that. As far as upfront costs, in self-publishing, there really are no upfront costs anymore. Um, what you can do is um, you can get everything ready to, 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 to publish, put the ebook on Amazon, put the um, uh, print book on, say, Create Space, which will also go to Amazon. They'll take an extra cut there. Um, and then you can order your own copies for, for, for cost to give out, to, to you know, uh, give as gifts or whatever. Um, but you never pay anything up front. So when you go to Create Space, you'll find that um, they have um, black and white or color interior. They have like the um, uh, cream color or, or blank, you know, flat white color for pages. So that's the same cost. Um, you can actually go in and, and there's a price calculator. This size trim, because that's the amount of paper they use. Um, this many pages. Um, you can see exactly what that will cost to print. And then uh, you can, from there, you determine if you're there for gifts, or for yourself. That's what you pay. If if you are going to sell it online, then you can from there figure out what you want to market up at. Any other questions? 
Uh, one and then two. Uh, Nate, I just have a quick question. Um, how much money? Do you know of any anybody making any money uh, doing this? So I worked really, really hard to get some sci-fi novels up under my own name. I've done some technical consulting for some romance authors, and so I went to the process, wrote some nonsense, 3,000, 5,000 word short stories, went through the process to know exactly step by step. And I actually made, I shouldn't say, I made $2,000 last year, right, with very, with no effort. So um, basically piggybacking off of their, their experience. Um, I, between scale and getting a ghostwriting offer from someone who's making a lot of money, he's like, if you write a 50,000, uh, I'll give you a template, hit the beats here. If you write a 50,000 word story, I'll give you $1,500 per story. And if you do really well and keep doing it, maybe we'll increase it if it does well. Um, he made $680,000 last year, and he's making about 20000 every month, and he's doing some ghost writing, he does his own writing, um, and he has a lot of experience. He shared experience in that private group. He's the nicest guy I've ever known. When I said, let me make sure I know the process. I'm selling books, so they're formatting right. I'll go through. Um, I, just did, I, I ignored his advice, did one book, because it took me three hours to write. I did another, it took me another six hours. Wrote another book, did the marketing, different cover, different type of photo styles, keywords, blurbs. And uh, I sold about eight times more. I, I made, uh, I think, $160 that month on that one book. Um, so if you're writing on Kindle right now, if you're writing short stories, if you keep publishing short stories, you're going to make a, couple hundred, a few hundred dollars a month, usually, once you learn what's, what's going on, if you pay attention. If you write novels, you can make uh, substantially more than that. In the right genre, uh, romance is really big right now. Sci-fi and fantasy are really big. Literary fiction can be big. You kind of, kind of have to look at the draw there. Um, there's some luck involved at any rate. But you can, if you want to do this as a side job, you can make a few hundred dollars, uh, a couple hundred dollars a month, and it's fun and you get paid for it, right? If you want to actually do it for real, there are only certain genres that you can really make a lot of money in, but it is totally possible. So, uh, any other questions? Over here. Indexing. I noticed you didn't mention that. That's an art in itself. I've done a lot of foreign, in, foreign language indexing. Do you know how important an index is for nonfiction? Did you do it yourself or did you find it out? Good question. So, uh, especially because my book was, uh, was uh, sort of uh, went past schedule, uh, my publisher was, my editors were very concerned. We were at about chapter and a half left. I said, so what about front matter? What is going on there? And like, you know, we really want you to concentrate on the task at hand, and we can do that really quickly. And, it's not a, and I said, no, I, I don't, I want to know what I have to write, and I'll think about it in the back of my brain, I'll percolate. And I'm not going to waste any time until I'm done, but like, I, like it'll help me, and I don't worry about it. And then we do. And they're like, okay, here, yeah, right. And then I did exactly that. I, I, I looked at it, flipped through, I said, this is pretty cool. Wrote a, a, te a temporary uh, a placeholder dedication for the book, and then uh, I went back to writing. Um, so in the front matter, I had the table of contents, for example, and they were very clear. Do not waste any time doing your table of contents instead of writing because you're behind schedule. Uh, we have people who do that. And they said the same thing um, once the book's finished. Cause I said, what's, what's we got a conference call on Skype? I said, what's next? I said, well, we take this, we finish the copy, edit it, it goes here, it goes to the proofers, you look at that. At the same time, we send it to indexers. They actually have a firm listed in the copyright page of my book, of a firm that actually went through and indexed everything. Uh, I did, did get a copy in PDF form just before it went out. Looked good to me. Got the, got the final books out. And of course, there's one error. There's uh, one entry that loops back to itself. This, see this, something weird. Um, that I probably should have caught, but that wasn't my job, so I don't know. Um, so it was none of my problem. And traditionally, in traditional publishing, you, have, you don't have to worry about it. In self-publishing, if you're doing nonfiction, there are ways to uh, mark certain subjects. Uh, that later on LibreOffice can, can create an index for you. Um, for a nonfiction book, um, depending, depending on the length, like for this a reference book, my book's a reference book, so the index sort of makes or breaks the book because um, it's meant to be picked up and read, and the table of contents is really nice and clear. I, I wrote it that way, but if someone wants something specific, they can go and they can go to Firefox and see it's mentioned here and here and here, you can see it's mentioned here and here. Um, so indexing for nonfiction is super, super important. I would say if you're self-publishing, because it's such a unique skill, you should probably hire that out. 
Uh, I know it's nothing I ever wanted to do, and uh, so far I've been very lucky and succeeded in that goal of never indexing myself. Uh, other than that one error, I thought the index was actually perfect because they, they index things I never would have considered being the index. Um, so it's one of those things like layout or, or cover, you really want to have an expert do it. Um, I would publish with Afresh again in a second. They've been nothing but fantastic and helpful. Anytime there's a conflict or a concern, they, they cede to my expert knowledge, which was great. And um, uh, on the other hand, if I were writing anything shorter than this, even nonfiction, I'd probably do it myself because um, I can make a little more money that way. Is there a question? How hard would it have been if I hadn't had an in um, to break into the publishing industry and, and, and become an author? Um, the answer is not hard at all, actually. Um, and well, I know one of the person who, who, who got in contact and they loved the suggestion, but now that I think about it, I recommend them too, so I guess that doesn't count. Um, I was told very clearly when I finished this book that um, as my editor sort of changes decisions that she um, is in charge of picking out any Ubuntu books that they publish. So I have, so I have other Ubuntu authors have an email proposal. Now, just because I recommend someone doesn't mean they're going to publish the book. They want the proposal to be fine. The only thing is that they, the only difference is they know to expect you. So having that can help. If you know, if you have a friend who's an author, for example, and uh, you know, uh, you have a manuscript in their style, you can have them send a, a, a letter. Or when you send a letter, you say, you know. Um, this is my manuscript, and um, usually you start a query letter with the synopsis at the, the end. So, you know, uh, I admire um, the book you did here for my friend. You submit, you you, you worked with their script, and they recommended I, that uh, your services. They loved you as an agent. Uh, with the caveat that um, when you say, you know, my you you're, you represented my friend, um, that must be true. You cannot send them a query letter and say, so my. Good friend Stephen King said that you'd want to look at this, right? That's, um, that's not going to help you. So um, um, it can be a little more daunting, but um, uh, other than the fact they, they asked me, as it turned out, but if I had submitted to, um, I don't, I want to say submissions at afress.com, but I don't know, I emailed her directly. If you go to afress.com or any publisher, um, you should find a place for submissions. And it's scary to just send uh, a query letter or so on, but in real life, that's how books get found and published. Um, I, I had a little bit of a leg up because they were expecting something. I got to ask them, well, because they're like, you know, do you have any books? Do you have any suggestions? What would you like to write on? What do you feel comfortable? I said, well, what kind of books would you like? And they didn't really want to tell me because they didn't want to tell me what their publishing goals were for the next two years, right? Because they don't want to tell other people that, right? Um, but they did give some suggestions, some beginner, uh, whether it's beginner, or intermediate, or advanced level books on this topic or general topics. And so then I, then I was sort of on my own. Um, so uh, it's actually pretty easy to break in, easier than you would think. Um, Yeah, if it's nonfiction. If it's fiction, you have to have the book. If nonfiction, yeah, you find a publisher, you find you know, who it is that, that you, books you admire, if it's in that style, um, because that's what they sell. Yeah, you go there and you, you can, so go to their website, look for their submissions page. They'll say, they'll tell you exactly what they want. And if you are smart, you will give them exactly what they want, because that's the easiest way to discount a problem author, a problem author who's going to not do things the right way and create lots of work. They can't even get the submission right. So double check all the submission guidelines. They're not hard, and yet people still don't do them. Be certain font, this and that. They'll say, I want this or that. Actually, when I said, yeah, I'd like to write a book, um, they actually gave me a guide, I believe. A-Press said, we want this and this and this and that. And it was uh, pretty easy. It's probably online. Uh, A-Press is really open. I'm going to give you some idea what to, what to suspect. Um, any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Haynes. And so um, before you go, on the back table, there is a pamphlet uh, of information about this. And um, so I have a question. Who has a friend who they want to use Ubuntu but is afraid to use Ubuntu? You don't count. Does anyone have a friend who um, 
yeah, or for someone who's just starting out and just kind of wants to know where to start. So, because I will give this copy of my book for free to one of those people. Do you want it? In the aisle, you can have this. Thank you.